On to the New News Church of Christ, a little bit behind time, but we're going to get started now for our Sunday morning Bible class. It's certainly glad to have you all you here with us this morning in the class, as well as you who are tuning in through Zoom and YouTube. Uh, we have been doing a series on the life of Christ, and currently we're on the Sermon on the Mount, part three. And today it'll be Christ and the Old Testament, Christ and the Old Testament. As you know, we've been doing this theme for a couple of weeks now on the life of Christ, a very integral study, one that would help many of us who are members of the Lord's body, the church, as well as those who are investigating uh, the life of Christ, who are seeking out the Lord themselves, those who may not be members of the body of Christ. But for those of us who are, it gives us an opportunity to look into the life of Christ and to see what the Lord would have us to be and to do in his kingdom. So before we continue on in our uh, study, we'll be in the book of Matthews, if you're tuning in with us, and we'll be on in chapter five and looking at verses 17 through 20. That's Matthew chapter 5, 17 through 20. The life of Christ. Up to this point in the sermons, uh, the Lord went over certain things as we talked about last week. We see in this sermon that he talked about those that would be blessed. And of course, those of us in the lowest church and, and in religious world, we understand these to be called the Beatitudes. So we, we saw the, the type of character the Lord is looking for, for those that would be in his kingdom. And so the, 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 some have said the ideal man. And so we kind of went over those last week. And I think the week before we looked at some of these and uh, Brother Craig talked about these last week. And, and then in the summation of that, uh, the idea is to be an example somewhat to the world. And that what verse 16 says of verse 5. He says, now, let your light so shine before men uh, that they may see your good works and glorify your Father, which is in heaven. And so that's what the Lord desires of those who will be in his kingdom. But then there's a turn in the discussion a little bit here. And the Lord knew of the thoughts of those Jews and all that were uh, and he was encompassed by uh, at that time. The Lord knew some things. The Lord knew the hearts of all men. And so, yes, character is important. And so he begins to turn the discussion just a little bit now because of what he did know. And so we get to about verse 17 and here the Lord says, think not that I am come to destroy the law. And you just, just kind of like hold on to that just for a moment. Or the prophets, I didn't come to destroy the law or the prophets. I am not come to destroy, but to fulfill. For verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass, one jot or one tittle shall not in no wise pass from the law till all be fulfilled. That's verse 18. Let's look at verse 19. Whosoever therefore shall break one of these least commandments and shall teach men so, he shall be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. But whosoever shall do <clears throat> and teach them, the same shall be great in the kingdom of heaven. Verse 20, for I say unto you that except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees, ye shall in no case enter into the kingdom of heaven. Very profound words in the closing of that context there. Jesus needed to explain the reason why he was on the scene. Now, you know, the Jews held dearly to the law, and they did. 
Matter of fact, they heard, they held on to the law like a pit bull would to, to a bone. And they didn't want to let go of the law. But because of Jesus' teaching, it appeared to them that he was somewhat diminishing the law, which they held so dear. And because Jesus came teaching about what? Love and forgiveness. And that's not really um, emphasized a whole lot under that old law. And that's why, you know, they looked at him like, well, you know, okay, what, what are you teaching here? Jesus knew their thoughts. And so to them, it appeared that the law wasn't as important, that he was going to set it aside and do something else here. Is that what the Lord came to do? Of course not. That's, that's a misunderstanding, isn't it? Of course it's a misunderstanding. Like in a lot of the Lord's saying, there was misunderstandings at this point. The, the law, the, the Lord was describing, first of all, the type of character that would have been needed in the kingdom. The importance of being a part of that kingdom and how he's going to describe the importance of God's law in the kingdom. That's what Jesus came. So right before his sermon, he had three specific interactions with the Jews where they were trying to say that he was disobeying. The, remember that? He, they were saying he was disobeying the Sabbath. Oh, they watched him tooth and nail on every aspect of the law. They did. The Jews did. And, and, and Jesus proved them otherwise. Now, so the importance of this lesson today, as we, we come to this turning point somewhat in verse 17, is having a proper understanding somewhat of the Old Testament and the New Testament. You know what that saying is? The Old Testament is what? Anybody know? Hmm? Okay. Some say it's the law. Okay. I've had no one say school master. She got that out of the book of Galatians. Well, I got a little simple saying. Okay, I got revealed. The Old Testament, listen to this, is the New Testament concealed. And the New Testament is the Old Testament revealed. There it is. Is that correct? Yeah, that makes sense. When you think about it, as you start to study God's word, you'll see that there were some implications in the Old Testament that was strictly pointing to what? Jesus, pointing to the New Testament, the new covenant. Didn't the Lord, through a prophet named Jeremiah, said that he was going to replace that old covenant? He surely did. Back in Jeremiah 31, wasn't it? Yeah. Verses 31 through about 33. God said he was going to make a new covenant. Well, here, Jesus wants them to teach them the relationship between the Old Testament and the New. The purpose of each and how they relate to Christ's teaching are the things that many, unfortunately, in the religious world, misunderstand. Before we can move forward and understand Christ will for our lives, we have to agree on where to find Christ's will. You see, when he said, think not that I have come to destroy the law of the prophet, I came not to destroy it, but to fulfill it. Well, that's something to think right then. Well, we still hold on to the old law because he didn't destroy it. What they failed to read is the rest of it. He came to fulfill it. Well, is it any wonder that we who are Christians, members of the body of Christ, we are told not to be unwise. Did you know that? Ephesians 5, 17, be not unwise, but understand what the will of the Lord is. It is so crucial, so imperative that we come with a proper understanding of what is the Lord's will right now. Has the Lord's will ever changed in some matters? Ah. Well, let me ask you this. Who did he command to build an ark? Noah. That was his will at that moment. Was that, was that will for anyone else? 
No, it was just Noah. Yeah, he didn't ask anyone else to build that ark. He asked Noah to do it. That's right. When, when God had them to offer up sacrifices and stuff at the tabernacle, were the, uh, were the Gentile nations involved in that? Okay, that wasn't his will for them, was it? No, it was different, wasn't it? Oh, okay. All right. You see, 2 Timothy 15 is not a verse just of good words. Anybody know what 2 Timothy 15 is? 2.15. Oh, you've heard it. All right. Study to show yourself approved, a workman on a not, huh? Not to be ashamed. Rightly dividing what? The word of truth. You know how important that is? That is so important. That's why some people are in trouble today. They're still trying to go back to the Old Testament to justify themselves before God. And we're going to see that that's not the case. This very first verse, when I first looked at this lesson, I looked at that first verse, I said, "Woo, this could take all class. Just explain the first verse, verse 17. To illuminate their understanding, to help them to understand Jesus saying, I'm not here on the scene to destroy the law. That's not why I'm here. Guess what? I'm here to do something you couldn't do. Uh-oh. The Jews attempted. They tried. But they failed, didn't they? Yes, they did. They failed. Well, this should give us some more insight on the understanding of Christ's will and the Old Testament. These verses are very important. Well, let's first look at verse 17. And so Jesus says, I don't want to get ahead of myself. I get too excited. Slow me down if I get too excited. Well, hold on. We ain't there yet. What's that? Hebrews 10, 25? Okay, I'm going to call on you. Hold on to that. Yes, hold on to that. Uh, verse 17, he says, I have not come to destroy the law or to abolish it, but to fulfill. Now, the word in some versions, abolish means to loosen down or to dissolve or to undo. The Lord didn't come to undo the old law. He came to observe. What law was the Lord under when he was here? Huh? It was still under the Old Testament. At that point, how long was that law in place? Do you know? Have an idea? No, that's not the question. The question is, how long has that law been in place by the time Christ came? When was that law given? Yeah, Moses at Sinai, wasn't it? We're probably looking at about, oh, 1,500, 1,600 years that law been in place. Was Abraham under that law? No, he wasn't. No, he wasn't under that law. What kind of law was he under? Huh? Okay. Faith. It was a system, wasn't it? Patriarchal system. The father, the head. God spoke to the head of the fathers, didn't he? Of the, of the family, tribe. Isn't that correct? Ah. So then, then this law came to Moses and the Israelites after they had been freed from where? Egyptian bondage, right. And that law had been in place all the way up to now, and Christ is under that law. All right. So these people were really adhered to that. That law had been in place for a long time. And they're almost like looking at the Lord like, well, who are you to come on the scene here and speak those things that seem to be or to appear to them contrary to what the law is? Well, fulfill means 
that this is in contrast to what they were thinking to destroy. He came to fulfill the law. I, if I'm not mistaken, um, I had read in some place that there were like 613 ordinances under the Old Testament that they had to observe. Six, that's a lot. And, and they did the best that they could in observing the law. Christ's disciples needed a clear understanding of his relationship to the law and his attitude toward many, now here it is, of those traditions that were tacked on to the law. That's why you heard the Lord objecting on certain instances. Think about like in round about Matthew 15, remember that those scribes uh, was asking, well, why his disciples uh, ate with unwashing hands, remember that? And the Lord says, now, why do you make void the commandments of God? He, he, he reproved them and rebuked them. And so that was just one of those instances where Jesus had to reprove those so-called scribes and Pharisees because they had tacked on so many traditions to the law itself. Now, what does the traditions of men do? What do they avail to? Hmm? That's right. Brother Bob, give Matthew chapter 15, verse 9. This is one of those verses that we look at from time to time when we try to explain to someone about the traditions of men. Yes, sir. You hear that? The Lord says in preceding verses, he says, for you draw nigh to me with your lips, but your heart is far from me. He says, for in vain. What do they do in vain? They worship me in vain. What does vain mean? Empty, useless, nothing. It's to no benefit to you. For in vain do they worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. Isn't that correct? This is not in my notes, but I'm going to give you another one. Titus chapter 114 says that the commandments of men, watch this, turn from the truth. Ah, if you don't have that, mark that down. So we need to be careful on this side of eternity as Brother Dismuse so adamantly had preached in his series, hear ye him, make sure you hear in Christ and not some philosophy or mindset of some man. The commandments of men turn from the truth. Why is truth so important? Hmm? Okay. So the Lord said on one occasion, and ye shall know the truth, and the truth do what? Is truth important? You better believe it is. You better buy the truth and sell it not. That's what Solomon said. You need to know the truth in the matter. It's an imperative. It's a must that you learn the truth. The truth of God's will. What is God's will when it comes like to salvation? What is God's will when it comes to the worship? What is God's will when it comes to the church? You need to learn the truth in that. So what's the truth he's about to embark right here? He's about to embark truth concerning himself and the relationship to God's law. At that moment, at that time, it was the law of Moses. God gave it to Moses, right? It's not Moses' law. It's God's law. God gave it to Moses. Is that true? Of course it is. Somebody get Deuteronomy chapter 5 for me. Get Deuteronomy chapter 5 and uh, chapter 4, 13, and chapter 5, 2, and 3. And let's see who that law was given to them. Okay, we got to go back in the Old Testament just a little bit. Uh, I told you, verse 17, there's, there's a whole lot in here. I might make it to 18, 19, and 20. Deuteronomy chapter 4, 13, and what does that say? 
Okay, so here Moses is declaring unto who? Israel? That, that, that God has declared something to them. He declared to them those Ten Commandments that he had wrote upon the tables of stone. And he has commanded me, Moses said, to teach who? You. Isn't that right? Those statutes and judgments. Now, who was, was Moses talking to the Hittites? The Jebusites? The Canaanites? No, he wasn't. Verse 4, chapter 1, tells you who he was talking. Now, therefore, hearken, O Israel. The law was given to the Jews. Look at Deuteronomy chapter 5. If you look at 5, look at verse 2. The Bible says, the Lord our God made a covenant, a contract, an agreement with us in horror. That's on that mount. He said, the Lord made not his covenant with our fathers. Moses is probably referring back to Abraham. Them. That's right, the forefathers. He says here, but with us. That, that's Moses and the Israelites that had just left Egyptian bondage. That's what he's talking to here. He says, who are all of us here alive this day? Okay, so then we go back to where we are. And as I said earlier, many misunderstand Christ's teaching here. And unfortunately, some still believe the law is still binding. Well, let's find out if that's true or not. If that be the case, that would make Christ contradict his apostles, who were later guided by the spirit of truth, and that's the Holy Spirit, who would guide them in all truth. John chapter 16, verse 13. And so when Jesus went back to heaven, the Holy Spirit came and now began to reveal unto all men God's final revelation to all men. Is there going to be another revelation after this? No, sir. This is it. This is it. There's no more after this. And how do I know that would be a contradiction then? If God intended for the law to continue on. When I say law, I'm referring to the law of Moses. Brethren, it would do us good to learn how the law came and to learn how long it lasted and to learn why it's abrogated or abolished or done away with. Look at Ephesians chapter 5. We've, we've seen these. We know these verses. But I want us to... to Hon uh, honor our skills, hone our skills to be able to, to elaborate when we go to teach someone, you know, how long the law was last. Because there's a lot of people thinking, you know, well, you, you people, watch this now, of the Church of Christ, y'all don't believe in the Old Testament. No, that's not true. Yes, we do. We still believe in it. Yes, sir. It's just you need to learn how to divide the word correctly. That's the problem. Ain't that what Romans 15, 4 says? Romans 15, 4, y'all know that verse too. Wherefore, those things that were written aforetime were written for our learning that we through patience and comfort of the scriptures, watch this, might have hope. There you go. You see, the Old Testament is part of the story. When the last time you went to a movie or saw a movie, the movie is three hours long. You only saw an hour and a half of it, the first half, and then you leave. What's wrong? You don't know what happened the rest of the story. It's incomplete. Isn't that right? Or you come to a movie. It's three hours long. You come in on the second half, and there's an hour and a half left. Now, you don't know, well, well, how did we get to this point? I don't understand this. There's some things missing. Why? Because you never got the foundation from the beginning. That's the same thing when you go in the Old Testament. If you just go in the Old Testament only, you only see part of the story. You have to be able to go into the New Testament to see the rest of the story. That's how that works. In Ephesians chapter 2, verse 15, what did Paul say to this Gentile church? Keep that in mind. He's talking to a Gentile church, Gentiles who were not a part of that law, were they? Mm -mm. Isn't that what we were told back in verse 12 of chapter 2? Remember that? Well, look at verse 11. He says, wherefore, remember that ye being time past, Gentiles in the flesh. I'm looking at verse 11. He says, who are called uncircumcision by that which is called the circumcision. Well, the uncircumcision was who? The Gentile. The circumcision was 
the Jew. He says, in the flesh made by hand, that at the time ye were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel. In other words, you were not a part of that covenant. He says, he says and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. And that is the state of every person right now who does not have Christ. You're without hope. You're not a part of the covenant. That's right. And then he says, but now you've been brought nigh, what? By the blood of Jesus, who were sometimes far off. Now you've been made nigh. In other words, you've been reconciled back unto God. Isn't that correct? You learned that in verse 16. But look at verse 15. That's where I was really trying to get to. Verse 14, he says, Christ is our peace. Why? Because there was enmity between the Jew and the Gentile. Isn't that correct? Of course. Verse 15 says, having abolished, what happens when you abolish something? You do away with it. Having abolished in his flesh the law, well, the flesh, the enmity, the law of commandments contained in ordinances. What law? What law is that? Moses' law. That's right. He says, for to make himself twain one new man, so making peace. There's so uh he didn't destroy it. He was fulfilling it. That's, we're going to get to that in just a minute. That's what he was doing. He was doing something that the rest of them could not do. That's what the Lord, thank God Jesus came on the scene. Yes, sir. We needed someone that could obey every precept of the old law perfectly because the old law demanded that. And no man could do that. They tried, they attempted, but they failed miserably in it. And so I'm going to show you something here in just a minute. You know, this gets me excited, Bob. Oh, yeah, we get excited when we get into this old new law. Yes, sir. All my brethren, we need to have an understanding of this when we go to teach people. Because when certain subjects come up, unless you understand the difference between the old and the new law, it's confusion. And we need to understand what was the purpose of the old law and the bringing in of the new law, right? Well, the very minute, my brethren, those of you watching, the minute you open your Bible, you'll notice there's two great divisions in here. There's the Old Testament and the New Testament. Well, why is that? So you need a proper understanding in why is there an Old Testament and a New Testament. Without that proper understanding, you're going to have misunderstanding. Am I correct? All right. Well, Colossians 2, 14, chapter 2, verse 14, 16 tells us a little something, doesn't it? Oh, yes, it does. We're still talking about verse 17. We haven't gone anywhere. Still talking about verse 17. So as we think about those, those decrees, those, those ordinances, notice what Paul said here. Oh, chapter 2, he says, and you being dead in your sins, verse 13, and the uncircumcision of your flesh, have he quickened together with him, having forgiven you all your trespasses. Boy, that sounds good, doesn't it? Look at verse 14. Blotting out the handwriting of ordinances. That's those decrees that were against us. Notice how the language he used that were somewhat against us. Why in the world would you hold on to something that's somewhat against you? Why would you hold on to that? Paul said that blotting out those handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was, watch this, contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross. What did he take out of the way? What was nailed to the cross? Yeah, the Lord was nailed to the cross, but that wasn't all that was nailed to the cross. Something else was nailed there. The law. That's right. Now, I want you to just hold on just something for a second. Verse 15, and having spoiled the principalities and powers, he made a show of them openly triumphing over them in it. He triumphed. In other words, the Lord was able to fulfill every aspect of that law, which no one else could. Thank God he came. God, because the law demanded that every precept of it be met. 
Oh, I'm going to tell you, those sayings, they had a lot on that cross. When Jesus was up on that cross and he finally uttered those words, it is finished. Thank God. Man's, man's salvation, his redemption is a reality now. He made it possible. I don't see how any Christian could neglect to obey God in this matter when God did everything. Uh, I thought about Brother Dispute teaching on that one Wednesday night when he said God did everything to put up barriers to make sure you don't get to hell. And Jesus came and did all of the Father's will. Look, let me, I'm going to stop right there. Just for a moment, I got so many verses in my head. Let's, let's look at something else. Let me tell you why Jesus didn't come to destroy the law, but to fulfill it. It's because of some things like Acts 13, verse 39. You remember when Paul was in Presidia and Paul was speaking in the synagogue and he said, he told them that no man could be justified by the law. Acts 13, 39. Remember that? Oh, yes. Aren't you glad he fulfilled it? Can't be justified by the law. Don't you want to be justified? Of course you do. Don't you want to be made right in the sight of God? Yes. Who is it that justifies us? God does. That's correct. Yeah, you, you can't justify yourself. No, the Lord justifies us. Did you know that, hmm, let's see, just for a second. Uh, in Galatians chapter 2, did somebody go to Acts 13, 39? Did somebody get there just for a second? Now, now, wait a minute. Now, you hear what he said? And by him, who is he trying to convince here? Them Jews. He's trying to convince them. And by him, you see that, verse 39? All that believe are justified by him. You know, you still, Jews still had a problem with Jesus, didn't they? Of course they did. There was something that still had a problem. And now here you have Paul, who once was against the faith, now is a part of the faith, is preaching on his first missionary journey. And he's telling these Jews in Pisidia, at, uh, at Pisidia, at Pergia, uh, in Antioch, he's telling them about this Jesus. And, and as my brother was reading, and by him all that believe are justified from all things, it was by him, not the law of Moses. Watch this. He says, from which ye could not be justified by the law of Moses. Did you hear that? Can't be justified by the law of Moses. And then later we'll learn in the book of Galatians. Y'all know that book there, right? I know I'm moving kind of quick. My time running. But in Galatians. Look at Galatians chapter 2. You know, we're still on verse 17. That's right. I came not to destroy, but to fulfill. And we ought to be thankful that he came and fulfilled it. Look at Galatians 2, 16. Knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law. It would be help, helpful for us to understand somewhat that in somewhat case, what that means, that means those practices and things that were uh, uh, commanded of the old law, man could not be justified in them. Though he did them, he did like the Lord asked him to do. And we, we're going to see why here in a minute. He says, but by the faith of Jesus Christ, he says, even we believed in Jesus Christ that we might be justified. Now, here comes the justification in Christ Jesus. Why? Because Christ met all of the uh, commandments or the ordinances of that law. He did. He fulfilled it. And so if we believe in the son, we can be made right. Is that correct? In, mm. Isn't there a verse that just came to mind? Y'all remember 2 Corinthians 5, 21? You've heard it from time to time in the pulpit. Heard Brother Dismuth said it. Maybe I've, I've said it a couple of times. For, you know, that God, to wit, that God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself. Remember that? About old 2 Corinthians 5, verse 19, 18, 19. Then you get down there about verse 21. It says, for he made him to be sin who knew no sin. Think about that. God always required the innocent to die on the behalf of the guilty. Who's guilty? We are. 
For he made him to be sin who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God. Ah, did you hear it? In him. You hear that? It's in Christ. Everything's in Christ, brother. The key word is in Christ. There it is. That preposition, in, in Christ. Not outside of Christ, in Christ. To be made the righteousness of God in him. Isn't that correct? Well, look here, when we, when we think about what it says here in 16, he says, and, and not by the works of the law, can't be justified by the works of the law, for by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. Uh-oh. I can't go back to the old law and those order to justify myself. Do you think that's some sterling news to the Jews? Of course it is. They held on that thing for so long. You see, Matt, uh, Romans 10, 4, you don't have to go there, but Christ is the end of the law. Did you hear it? It's the end. Until it stopped right there. That makes sense then when you look at Colossians 2, 14 and 16, doesn't it? Of course it does. You want a little more elaboration on this? Look at, look at Hebrews chapter 10. Man, my time moving, y'all. That's okay. Huh? <laughs> yes, that's right. <laughs> yes, sir. That's right. <laughs> Man, that law was a school bus, wasn't it? It picked you up and took you to the learning institution, which is Christ. Isn't that right? Okay. That's the schoolmaster. All right. Excellent, excellent explanation. Yes, yes, sir, Brother Bob. Okay. Yes, sir. And I'm so glad he fulfilled it, aren't you? I'm so glad he met the requirement. But I want you to see something in, in Hebrews chapter 10. We know these verses. But I'm just going to read them right quick. Just give us a quick. For the, the law having a shadow, and that's all it was. It was a shadow of good things to come and not the very image of those things. Can never with those sacrifices which they offer year by year continue to make the comers there unto perfect. You remember back in chapter 9, you learned that your conscience was not clear. Because there was a remembrance of sin year after year after year. Remember that? That was back in chapter 9. And then so for when, when they could not have ceased to be offered, verse 2, that the worshipers once purged should have no more conscience of sin. But in those sacrifices, there is a remembrance again made of sin every year. Now, we know about that part where it says it's impossible for the blood of bull and goat to remove sin. Verse 5, wherefore, when he cometh, oh, we're talking about the Lord now. When he cometh into the world, he saith, sacrifice and offering thou wouldest not, but a body has thou prepared me. In other words, in a human form. He came and was made like unto his brethren. The Lord could have came in any form he wanted to, but he came just like unto his brethren. He came because he demonstrated the fullness of what the law required. He was the perfect picture. This is what God wanted of man. He wanted to demonstrate to man what he was looking for. And Jesus came and took on that flesh and showed us what a perfect picture looked like. The perfect pattern. The ideal man. God brought the truest of sense out of the law, what it intended that man failed to do in his imperfections. The law was not just some rule of words. It had life in it, but it took someone to bring that out, to reveal to them a more deeper meaning of what the law meant that the Jews failed to see or understand. 
Remember what Jesus said in John chapter 5, verse 3? For ye search the scriptures and think in them that you have eternal life, and they are they which testify of me. <laughs> like that? And what else did Jesus say? Verse 40, and you will not come to me that you might have life. That's verse 40. But back here in Hebrews 10, watch this. He says in verse 6, in burnt offerings and sacrifice for sin, thou hast had no pleasure. Because God had something else in mind. That was a temporary. Yes, sir, brother. Didn't burn. That's right. And I like that. You say the obedience. Because in verse 7, the Hebrew writer wrote, then said I, lo, I come. What is it, Lord? I come to do thy will, O oh God. You hear it? He says, above when he said, sacrifice offerings and burnt offerings and offerings for sin, thou wouldest not, neither had its pleasure in them, where, where, which are offered by the law. He says, then said he, lo, I come to do thy will. You hear it? Oh God, he taketh away the first that he may establish the second. Okay, I might stop. All right. That was verse 17, y'all. <laughs> Had a little bit more, but we're going to stop right there. All right. Thank you for your time and your attention. Um, I, I don't know if Zoran is teaching next week. If not, we're going to continue on a little bit more on this. Thank you for your time.